Um, welcome back, at least I hope for most of you it's welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the president of the Institute, and it's my privilege to open this, uh, this joint event that we're very proud to co-host with Kai Xin, uh, China's leading financial news and information source. Um, we've been very privileged to work with them and with many good friends to bring together an event on, as it says here, China and the world, recalibration and realignment. Uh, let me give you a tiny bit more meat on why we're doing this and what that means, and then I will turn to Madam Hu from Kaishin to give some of the opening remarks as well. Uh, we're all very aware of the fraught, um, tense, and potentially dangerous nature of U.S.-China economic relations at the moment. I think most of us would believe that there are real reasons for dispute, but I also know that all of us here at the Peterson Institute believe that there are needs for constructive dialogue and analytically based assessment of what really is at stake, including the risks coming out of trade war, the benefits coming out of ongoing China-U.S. economic integration and interaction, and the need to deal with any emerging conflicts between U.S. and China in a rules-based format, ideally multilaterally, but of course with a critical bilateral component but that bilateral component should be an economics, technocratic, constructive one and not a political tit for tat. In that light, we do not wish today to dwell on the particular tariff lines that are being bandied about the fate of sorghum and soybean. Um, I do not make light of that. And as you know, many of our colleagues, most prominently, of course, Chad Bown, Jeff Schott, and others are working very hard on these issues at all times. And thanks to Melina Kolb and the publications team here, we have a now ongoing monitor on our webpage of the developments in U.S.-China trade relations at a very micro level, and I encourage you all to make use of this resource. But we also want to step back and ask people, both in the U.S. and China, to think constructively about the broader macro picture. And I mean that both in the narrow economic sense of financial macroeconomic issues, which of course are at least as critical as trade and are in fact the ultimate determinants of the, any trade balance, but also in the more loose sense to think about the long-term path of Chinese economic development, to think about the financial opening up of China, to think about the way of reform both in the U.S. and China and how that plays out. And it's in that spirit we've worked with Kai Jin to put together this program with a host of, we think, absolutely superb, both former, current public officials, financial and business sector leaders, as well as scholars and academics. Please let me turn to Madam Hu for some opening remarks. Thank you, Ed. Uh, dear guests, uh, welcome to the public forum jointly organized by Caixin Media and our dear partner, PIIE. I always think April is the best time to visit DC, not just for the cherry blossom, but because the world's best months of financial economics gather here every year for insightful discussions. And we all know that the best months are needed these days to give sound advice on U.S.-China economic relations. Cai Xin covers U.S.-China relations closely. And believe me, this is never a dull moment. 
but we want to shape today's discussion from a different perspective, through a wider lens that allow us to sit back and think more broadly, not just on US China, but on China's rise, how China came to where it is today, how its sons go forward, how it should go forward, and how the world should foster this path. That is why we titled today's forum, China and the World, Recalibration and Realignment. We'll discuss, and just what's and we'll discuss not just what's new, but also what's fundamental. Through that wider lens, we will see that the opening up policy is not just a bunch of nice sounding keywords mentioned by President Xi Jinping last week, but the cornerstone of the country's economic development over the, fa the last 40 years. And through that lens, you will see how China has coped with tensions and challenges through, throughout this year, the years which it often turned into renewed power for reforms, for its own good, and for its own pace. Many of you are Cai Xin's old friends and loyal readers. I also want to take the opportunity to report on you our own ambitions. How I see the independent media's role in China's transition and the world's re realignment. For years, We've been a leading international media organization with Chinese insight and perspective. And today, we will be the platform for informed, result-oriented discussions on China's rising economy and on the world. With all the complexities and nuances, the dis disagreements and the consensuses. Because that will, and perhaps that is, shaping our time. I invite you, our dear friends, to join this dialogue with the Caixin Roundtable, Roundtables. And I look forward to speaking with you online or in person. Without further ado, let's give the flower to our wonderful panelists today. Thanks again to Adam and our PIIE colleagues for the gracious collaboration. Please enjoy. So I should probably stand on this also, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, we are starting off with one of the most critical panels and critical topics, which is the issue of financial opening in China, U.S.-China relations over financial regulation, their effect on the rest of the world. And this is obviously very much in play. We have the recent remarks of, of Mr. Li, as well as we have heard from the new People's Bank Governor, Yi Gong, on the plans to continue opening up China's financial sector. We, of course, also have heard expressions of skepticism from some American officials and businesses who find their past experience with such opening has not necessarily been rewarding. The truth, of course, lies somewhere in between. What's important is the future. And to think about where we are and what we need to think ahead in the area of financial regulation, supervision, financial opening, we have assembled an absolutely top flight panel. In order of speech and without giving them their full bios, we are leading off will be Sheila Baer, the former chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission and I am fond of saying a leading voice for financial reform in the American public debate. We've had her speak here on previous occasions, including the OK lecture on economics and ethics and economics here, and we're grateful to have Sheila back. Uh, next will be Jonathan Prusan, the CFO of Morgan Stanley. Uh, John has been a, one of the true leaders in that firm, which of course is one of the true leaders globally in investment banking and financial services. Some of you may have seen the news of their uh, quarterly earnings yesterday. Uh, I am much more excited 
to be able to interact with John as a member of the Institute's Board of Directors and as someone who thinks broadly about international financial topics, and we're grateful to have his considered remarks today. And then finally, um, Stanley Fisher, who we also were privileged to welcome back to the Board of, of Directors of the Peterson Institute following his public service for the umpteenth time um, as Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, it is impossible to overpraise Stan. I will simply quote myself on the last time I introduced him, I think. Um, for those of us in the central banking business, Stan is the uh, platonic ideal of what a central banker should be. Um, <laughs> and so, but he gets to speak last, so he didn't have to prepare anything, so that's good too. Um, Sheila, over to you. Well, thank you, Adam. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back at the Institute. Um, I'm a, I, I approach this as someone, uh, the former chair of the FDIC, and also someone who stayed very involved uh, with financial um, reform and regulatory issues, but also uh, for several years, actually, I've been on the International Advisory Council of the China Bank Regulatory Commission, so that's given me uh, somewhat of a, a window uh, into the system there and, and developments. And I will say, uh, so I'm, I'm going to focus mainly on the regulatory landscape, and there are others will be better uh, uh, equipped to talk about business opportunities and how real that is and how easy that will be. Um, you know, I was struck um, when I um, read President Xi's uh, comments to the, to the Communist Party uh, last late last year. Um, and so there, there are a lot of issues and, and challenges in China, and uh, I don't want to suggest otherwise. But he, uh, he articulated what I think was a sincere commitment to tighten credit. Uh, he acknowledged that there were problems. There was too much credit. They've actually slowed uh, the debt growth fairly significantly last year, the rate of growth last year. And he said, uh, you know, and I realize that there's going to be a trade-off here. We're going to have a slower economic growth, but we've got a problem. This is not sustainable, and we're going to paraphrasing. And so uh, I, I do think uh, that that is a, a, a refreshing thing to hear. Um, they obviously have significant problems in, in their banking system, but I think those are, those are being worked out. I think the recent changes in the regulatory structure will be helpful, uh, particularly combining the, uh, the CBRC, the China Bank Regulator, with the Insurance Regulator. Uh, another problem in China has been the growth of these so-called wealth management products that have been... Uh, Basically, the public views them as, as products that are at the safety of a bank deposit, but they've been offered by many insurers, uh, fueled very rapid, uh, reckless growth, and so they needed to uh, to close some regulatory gaps. And so I applaud that merger, and I think it's uh, also a, a a further sign of of sincerity and commitment to tighten regulation and regulatory gaps in China. So they are, you know, it's a, it's a it's a three thousand year old culture. They're they're taking the long term, but I think on this score. Uh, we should we should take a look at what they're doing because what I see in the U.S. is kind of a, a, a retrenchment now uh, that we fought for many years uh, to get uh, some very good uh, rules in place, especially on bank capital. And I was involved, and Vice Chair Fisher was involved, and Van Trillo and a lot of people put a lot of work into that. And now we're seeing, oh, we're, we're overregulating the banks, and we've got to juice the economy with credit. And so we're doing this with very, very low unemployment, uh, record profits uh, by the banks, uh, a large tax cut, uh, no evidence that I've seen that there's a, a credit search shortage in the U.S. economy. If anything, I think there are certain pockets where uh, we may have too much of a debt overhang. So in terms of looking at what's going on, the trend lines, uh, I see a tightening in China uh, for and a desire to make sure that their credit growth is at a pace that is sustainable, whereas I see what I think is a misguided effort in the U.S. here uh, to open the spigot further, to let banks themselves take on more leverage so they can do yet more lending uh, in a way that uh, is, does not uh, seem to be necessary to support the real economy and I think is, is short-term thinking. Uh, capital requirements here are, are particularly being challenged right now. The Federal Reserve recently put out a couple of proposals that would release about $120 billion of capital in the eight largest uh, bank, banks here in the U.S. That's about a 20 percent reduction. And as a former chair of the FDIC, I obviously worry about that. That's also uh, capital that protects uh, the FDIC and the government if any of those banks should get into trouble. But typically in good times, if you're, if you, if you're taking the long view, not the short view, if you're taking the long view, in good times, you want banks to have strong capital buffers and maintain those buffers. 
because next, you know, we're going to get into a business cycle. We're going to get into a downturn. And at that point, they will have unexpected losses. They will need to draw on those buffers to continue to lending in the downturn. They didn't have that in the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, they were too highly leveraged. And so when the crisis hit, they had all these losses on their, their, their mortgage uh, securities and derivatives and other structured products. They didn't have the capital to absorb it, had to pull back on lending. And that's one of the reasons why we had the Great Recession. So um, I do think that uh, this is something, you know, uh, I want my country to be competitive and I want my country to maintain its economic leadership and I want my country to have a sustainable, healthy uh, economic growth. Where, where debt is not, uh, it, which, is, which is not infused by a highly leveraged, uh, highly leveraged banking system or reckless lending. So I think we need to learn in terms of our dialogue uh, that uh, our policies should take the long view. Um, moving on from, from system stability to uh, some other issues related to, to regulatory arbitrage and financial technology, I think these are also issues that uh, that both countries uh, confront. Uh, in China, uh, there is a very, um, uh, I think China's ahead of us, frankly, in the use of, of technology to deliver financial services. They don't have the same restrictions we do on commercial entities uh, getting involved in financial services. They have some very large technology con con companies that are very big in the payment system getting into lending now. And so that may be good in terms of uh, a customer uh, broadening access, responsible access to responsible credit, but there are always issues of regulatory arbitrage. I think they're a little ahead of us in confronting those issues. We're seeing the same dynamic here in the U.S. We're hearing Amazon wants to get involved. Uh, you know, PayPal, I, I think, perhaps is, has an interest in expanding its role in financial services. And so thinking through those, I think is important because we don't want to inter undermine our regulated uh, financial system. We don't want unnecessary regulatory barriers to financial innovation that, that, that are good innovations that help consumers, but we don't want to undermine the regulated system and allow an arbitrage to occur. And I think this is one of the key issues that financial te technology confronts, uh, presents for, for both of our countries. And here again, I think there are things that we can learn. Um, on the, on the other side, though, clearly uh, our system of private ownership is frustrated as, as I am uh, with, with large banks continuing to lobby, lobby for lower capital. I still believe in the private ownership system of banking in the U.S. I think it is, uh, it works, you know, it, it, private ownership, whether it's banking or in any other area, you achieve efficiency of allocation of resources, credit decisions that it, it's just very difficult to obtain with a state-owned uh, and run system. And so I tend to think that uh, China is sincere in viewing that competition, that model is healthy and learning from it. And so I'm hopeful that um, what we're hearing in terms of opening uh, the sector up uh, will be, will be uh, genuine because I think, I think China, if anything, based on my uh, experience, is that um, they want to do what works and they can see value in, in, uh, in additional private ownership. It's already achieved some important efficiencies for them, and I think they can see continued benefits. So I uh, actually, uh, I'm very concerned now in terms of the, oh. is that? I, I won't, I won't. I'm sorry, that I, was my watch, it was I won't alive. I, I, thought won't I, turned, I won't deduct it from your time no, if you make I, it I stop. Turned, I turned off my cell phone, I failed to turn off my smartwatch. I am so embarrassed. I thought it was you, Stan. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I think, you know, I think long term, uh, look, our, our interests are aligned. The, the Trump administration has, has raised some, some real issues, especially in technology. I just hope everybody can sit down and work, uh, work those out because uh, trade wars and tariffs in particular do not help anyone. And we do have a structural problem here. Uh, we, uh, you know, we consume more than we produce at the bottom line. And, and we, we fund that by borrowing money uh, overseas. And the budget deficits we're running now is just going to exacerbate that problem. China, on the other hand, uh, needs more domestic demand, and I think they recognize that. They need to grow their middle class. They rely too much on, on their export market. So overall, I think if we can get our fiscal house in order and understand that you know, one of the best things we can do for our economy and for our working families in particular is to focus on making our own economy more competitive, of getting smarter about investing in education, job training, have an outcomes-based uh, education system, infrastructure spending, oh my gosh, how long have we been hearing about that? But the, the infrastructure is, is in bad shape in this country, and that also creates a drag on economic growth. 
Meaningful tax reform, I think, uh, could do a lot as well. We, we got a little bit of that, but we got a huge deficit uh, last year as well. But, you know, a, a tax code that's riddled with, with special benefits and, and privileges and, and breaks uh, for certain classes, that also creates a lot of inefficiency uh, in economies. It skews their resource allocation. So I think there are a lot of things here at home we can do to make our economy uh, more competitive, and I, I wish that would be and could be a larger uh, part of this debate. But again, I think long term, uh, the interests of the two countries uh, continue to be aligned, and I hope we can get over our current uh, tensions and and uh, resolve some of the legitimate issues that have been raised, but, but move forward for both of our economies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, John? Great. Thanks, Adam, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And. Um, our relationship, both um, mine as a board member and also our firm uh, with the Peterson Institute, has been uh, has been quite um, uh, helpful for, for for us. And so, thank you for that. And I'm honored to be here with Sheila uh, and Stan Fisher, a clearly distinguished uh, group of panelists. Uh, Adam asked me to talk about three things uh, briefly. One, just our uh, Morgan Stanley's presence in China and our commitment uh, to the region. Second, the need for regulatory harmonization, uh, and then lastly, some of the future reforms and maybe on the uh, horizon. In terms of our presence, obviously, uh, China is the second largest economy in the world, represents a significant opportunity for global companies. Uh, our research team recently put out a piece uh, that believes the China growth story is intact uh, and will uh, achieve high income status in 2027. So they're very bullish on the opportunity in China. And they do believe, although there are challenges, that they will make it through um, this growth uh, trans, um, uh, this uh, transformation away from uh, uh, the export uh, and more into the domestic economy. Also, uh, we've seen in the overall economy opportunities in new sectors such as IT, consumer health care, and financial services. Uh, they continue to attract uh, investor. Uh, and capital in the region. Uh, investor sentiment is very um, interested in the region given the growth dynamics and some of the innovation that we've seen there. Just look at Alibaba's Alipay uh, and what it has done to the payment system in just three years. Uh, the innovation is actually quite amazing. Uh, several other Chinese firms have also emerged from domestic champions to become multinational companies, challenging uh, incumbents and in growth uh, industries globally. Morgan Stanley clients are at the center of our strategy and their interest in the region. Uh, continues to increase as the markets liberalize and become more transparent. This is not a new theme, nor do we think it will abate anytime soon. We first entered Ch China 25 years ago. We were one of the first investment banks there. We gradually built up our presence to the point where our onshore institutional platform in China essentially replicates our global platform to the extent allowed under current regulations. In 1995, together with China Construction Bank, we founded uh, China International Capital Corp, the first securities joint venture in China. While we're no longer involved in CICC, we are proud to have played a role in their formation. Today, <clears throat> we have a foreign bank uh, license in China. Uh, we also, in 2008, set up a fund management joint venture, followed by our current securities JV in 2011. Uh, these two JVs comprise our main shore, uh, onshore uh, business and capabilities. Offshore, many of our investment bankers, traders, and salespeople are involved in our China business, uh, whether it's trading equities through the Stock Connects. Uh, we're obviously excited about some of the comments regarding the increase uh, in volumes as well as a, a setting up of the uh, London um, Shanghai Connect, uh, or helping Chinese companies to list overseas or do M&A around the world. Our approach to building China's presence has been a function of how the country has liberalized, <clears throat> excuse me, in its financial services sector over the years and the growth of the markets. Uh, two, need for regulatory harmonization. Over time, with increasing international connectivity, we should see a convergence between the supervisory approach of China's financial regulators and those of other major markets. China's perspective will differ at times due to its unique financial services model, but regulatory harmonization is an important element to continue to attract foreign investment. China is the only emerging market economy with banks among the 30 GSIBs. China's regulators have hosted supervisory colleges for the country's four largest banks, and participating in these supervisory challenges, excuse me, colleges, is a key way for the supervisors to build up mutual trust and cooperation. They also participate in the G20, the Financial Stability Ball, uh, Board, and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. One area we'd like to continue to see better harmonization is the treatment of certain derivative contracts and the harmonization of the rules around derivatives. Current rules create challenges for capital treatment and 
regulatory arbitrage across uh, different uh, jurisdictions. Lastly, on the further reforms, over the last few months we've been encouraged uh, to hear the commentary on financial reforms. At the Boao Forum, President Xi announced measures in a timetable for further financial sector reform in order to increase the attractiveness of domestic uh, financial markets to foreign investors, China should continue to refine uh, its rules. I'll take uh, a moment to just comment on a few that we think uh, are important. First, China can enhance legal certainty and predictability. For our securities joint venture, we are encouraged to hear about the government's plans to allow us to own 51 percent of that venture and ultimately 100 percent within three years. However, the implementation of the rule uh, if it's overly onerous or unpredictable, it may contail our f foreign investment. If China wants to be a true open market and operate on a global basis, it has to let international comp companies operate as they would in other parts of the world. And for our clients, there are many aspects of market structure and market practice which continue to look unfamiliar to global investors. A few examples include the IPO process and trading su suspension procedures. Like many, we expect China equity markets will have significant global weightings and in institutional portfolios in the future, and legal certainty and predictability are critical to encouraging these allocations. Second, China can improve the domestic credit rating system by opening up domestic credit rating market for quickly to foreign participants. As of right now, uh, no foreign credit rating, rating agencies are allowed to rate uh, China companies, and we think uh, it's difficult for investors to have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison when credit ratings are not harmonized internationally. And then just lastly is better protection uh, for intellectual property rights. Uh, for most companies, protecting IP is critical. Financial services is, is, is clearly in that camp. If China pursues regulatory harmonization and creates a level playing field, it will be more attractive for global financial firms to operate in the region, and this will also benefit Chinese firms as they become multinational over time. Let me just quickly wrap up by saying we believe the authorities have ably steered, steered the financial sector reforms over the past generation, and we believe they will continue to do so. We also believe that China's financial markets and regulation will continue to integrate with the rest of the world, benefiting global growth and financial stability. We look forward to supporting China in the next phase of their reform and development. Thank you very much, John, for the private sector perspective. Uh, Stan? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Adam, and to Keijin for uh, supporting this this seminar on this important uh, topic. And excuse uh, the fact that I have a cold. Um, but we've all said nice things about the dispute. I think uh, the nicest thing one can say is it is encouraging that China is acting like an adult in this particular trade dispute. And, um, but I get worried on the other side. I'm just looking <laughs> through the stuff that we were handed as we came in, and somebody has written something called the, the post-American world economy. Yeah. I don't know where the America is going in the meantime, but uh, you'll let us it, know. It's, it's post. It's post. <laughs> it's, post. it's post already. Yeah. Um, you know, when... Uh, when we were asked to think about the broader macroeconomic issues, I looked at Ann Kruger, and uh, if this was uh, 25 years ago, and we still believed in the uh, Washington consensus, as I do, uh, we'd have consulted Ann and asked her what to do, and I think she would have said the, uh, the normal advice applies to China or any country, which is get your macro accounts in uh, some close to balance, both budget, uh, budget uh, account and the, uh, and the foreign account, and uh, have your monetary and fiscal frameworks be such as to promise uh, stabilizing performance in future. Well, China's fundamentally done uh, something very close uh, to that uh, already. So that is, um, we're, we're well beyond that level of, uh, of giving advice. And I was uh, looking at the, at the uh, funds report on uh, the financial sector, and it goes into very complicated details. It, we're not talking about big picture where there's some huge problem. 
uh, without which we can't proceed, although there is a question about the size of the, uh, of the domestic debt uh, and uh, questions of how long the rates of increase that were occurred in the last uh, 10 years could be sustained. And uh, I believe uh, that I've heard the new governor of the central bank say that uh, the rates of increase of uh, national of the private uh, of of private sector debt have uh, have decreased significantly and uh, are actually neg negative for a couple of years. Well, that's an important part of it, but. We're at the stage at which what the sector, what this meeting was advertised as being about uh, international cooperation on coordination uh, becomes uh, very important. And China took part in the discussions which were most responsible for uh, international coordination on the reform of the uh, regulatory systems of the major countries uh, through the FSB, through the Basel Committee, and a variety of others, and that has happened. Uh, there was a lot of coordination. There were a lot of complaints in the United States about having our rules made for us somewhere else. Um, well, yes, that's a bad thing, but it's not entirely true. Our rules have to be put into our system so that they become our rules no matter where they were made and they have to be implemented uh, domestically so I wasn't quite sure how else regulatory coordination was going to take place or whether there were people who thought you could manage without regulatory coordination. There is no theorem that I'm aware of that says that if you put a bunch of regulators in each country and give them their freedom, the forces of competition produce an optimal outcome. <laughs> <laughs> we all like to think that, but it isn't uh, true. And the bargaining that took place in, uh, in Basel over the uh, reform of the regulatory system uh, was extremely important and a lot got done. Well, there is a problem with all these things. If you're trying to prevent crises, you're focusing on a situation which is likely to occur if the frequency is very high once every 10 years. If the frequency is very low and you run the system reasonably well, it'll be every 80 years as we've had in the uh, past two crises. And you've got to keep the memory of the decision makers uh, who should be worrying about these things. You've got to keep them worrying about what's going to happen 80 years from now. Well, uh, we have just seen, uh, or we are in the process of seeing a process in which that thing has broken down. We're not seeing 10 years after the crisis began and two years after roughly we reached coordination on that, uh, that the system, the conclusions that were reached by those who were involved in the crisis, and maybe they were exaggerating, um, that that process will remain in place very long. We are already seeing a lot of political pressure which is successfully undermining the agreements that were reached not so long ago on the reform of the regulatory system and its details. Uh, in the United States and in other countries. And it's perfectly natural because you've got a whole bunch of uh, people who uh, explain to you that they have nothing to do with the crisis that happened. Um, I frequently say that I'm reminded by, uh, by what I'm seeing in Washington uh, of visiting South Africa after the handover of power which is it turned out there was no white person who ever supported apartheid. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no banker who had anything to do with a crisis, as far as I can uh, tell. And uh, it's very bad news. And how you keep this um, 
this uh, new agreement in place, or something close to this new agreement in place, is something which at this stage is beyond us, and uh, which we will have to figure out uh, how how to uh, how to do. I want to end on a simple qu challenge for the economist here. It is not entirely clear to me what is the optimal frequency of crises. And this is a serious question, this is a serious issue. Um, whatever regulatory system you have in place, however brilliant your central bank governors are and all that sort of stuff, you're not gonna get it right every time. Uh, and there will be crises. There'll always be crises because we're just not that smart uh, to prevent them forever in every circumstance. And I don't think we've thought about that very much. I mean, it could well turn out to be the case that having a, to deal with a crisis once every 40 years is also okay, uh, or maybe closer to optimal, because you're running a system with a different set of risks, and the question is, do you want it to be totally risk-free? You'll never get that, so what do you want? And we haven't, I think, thought about just how far a serious country should go in building its regulatory system with regard to what dangers it is willing to accept uh, in a system in which everybody is following the rules and let me leave that uh, challenge for all the economists sitting in the audience and let us know when you've got the answer, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, always like research challenges going out there. If a PIIE person is able to answer it, so much the better. Um, I would, this is an on the record symposium as, as, as Madam Hughes said, She's and Kaijin, like PIE, are eager to have exchange with our stakeholders and our audience. So we encourage you to come up and uh, make yourself known to ask a question or offer a comment. We particularly welcome some of our colleagues from China, given that it's so worked out. We have a lot of Chinese representation later in the program, but not on this panel. It just worked out that way um, to make comments and questions. The House rules are you have to identify where you're from, you have to pretend you're asking a question, not making a comment, and you only get one question or comment. Uh, we have roving mics at front, we have a standing mic at back. Please let me open the floor. Oh, come on, yes, please. <laughs> we don't control this. Jin Yong Tsai, I... Uh, I was uh, the CEO of uh, International Finance Corporation. The question goes to John. Actually, I was one of the first employee of CICC. I was hired by Morgan Stanley. And uh, so certainly Morgan Stanley, after all those years, has ups and downs on CICC. My question to you is, uh, with all the opening uh, announced, uh, do you believe uh, the international banks can be competitive in investment banking in the other areas? Uh, in the Chinese market. You know, that's, uh, you know, uh, during the lunch, Governor Yi has mentioned actually the volume going down. So, so thank you. Um, I think uh, we are excited about the opening up of the market and the potential increase in our ownership. Uh, that is going to be the ultimate question of how uh, competitive we can be. Four of the largest banks in the world are headquartered in China. Uh, as I mentioned, the four of the, the GSIBs and their formidable competitors. Um, but from our perspective, this market is large, it's growing, uh, and we have corporate and institutional clients who are interested in what's going on in the region. Uh, we have significant research capabilities on the country uh, to share with our clients, um, and so we'll continue to build up those capabilities. Um, you know, I think for certain products in certain areas, we can be very competitive like we've seen uh, around the world. We're the number one global equity franchises, and I think um, the sale um, and distribution of equities is an area um, that we could be very competitive. So I think there are places that we feel like we can compete. Uh, we are uh, hopeful that there is a level playing field, um, and we do think that this is not a six or 12-month uh, type of situation. We're thinking about this as a 5, 10, 20, 30-year 
uh, situation as the country continues to become more important in the global economy. Can I just sort of reverse the direction on, on Kai's question because I think it's, it's very good to go the other way and this is not so much just about Morgan Stanley obviously. Um, to what extent can one foresee Chinese banks becoming competitors to the other GSIBs outside of China? And I'm not asking you to say nasty things about Chinese banks, but I mean, in the broad, is part of the deal between U.S. and China going to be encouraging and expecting Chinese financial institutions to become big global players, or is it the U.S. and others tend to be good at financial services, and the Chinese take over or become big global players in something else? I mean, how do you how do you see that? Um. I think that's it's a it's a good question. I mean, if you look at the current competitive landscape, uh, obviously the the U.S. has a sig significantly largest capital markets in the world, uh, and therefore uh, from a from that perspective, I think in those types of businesses, the U.S. has generally done uh, quite well. Uh, certainly recently, as some of the other parts of the world have continued to work through uh, their own issues, um, but we have seen very successful foreign entrance in the United States. Uh, as well as um, from, from Asia as well. Uh, and the general capital markets and investment banking business is extraordinarily um, competitive. And it's competitive not only in the U.S. and our home markets, but obviously all over, all over the world. So I do think there is an opportunity. Um, there's always an insatiable um, desire for people to come into the U.S. because it is large and liquid and transparent. Um, and I think we'll continue to see people uh, compete with us in, in, in the U.S. and ultimately uh, how those shares um, disperse will be a question of, uh, of talent um, and the retention of talent. Sheila, is there anything you want to add from your perspective? As you mentioned, you're on the International Advisor Panel, the, CB, the formerly CBRC. Right. right. And I'm also uh, an independent director of ICBC. I, j I joined it last year. It, it's been a, a fascinating uh, experience for me. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but I, I do think there is a desire and recognition even by the, the largest banks in China to develop the capital markets in China, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, they don't really want to be as big. It's, you know, the contrast to the U.S., I mean, one of the reasons they are so huge is because almost all the credit is provided by bank lending in China, and that they need, I think there's a general recognition among uh, bank leadership and, and the bank regulatory community that they need to diversify their funding. So I, I would say that is a should be, I think, is a, a priority and hopefully one that would be right for partnerships with uh, with U.S. firms. Great, thank you. Another question or comment, please. Please. Uh, Michael Gadbaugh at Georgetown Law School. Uh, the model that the United States seemed to follow uh, up through the financial crisis was one characterized by uh, privatizing the gains and socializing the losses. Uh, China seemed to have been very critical of that and said, um, you know, you handled other areas of regulation but not finance. Uh, but they seem to have moved more toward socializing the gains if you're going to socialize the losses. I wonder if you could comment on that uh, and whether that's at all uh, an accurate depiction of what might be happening. Well, um yeah, I mean, I, I think, think the worst of all worlds is that you privatize the gains and socialize the losses, and that's kind of what we had in 2008. And so we're, again, I think that gets back to, um, again, you can't force banks to plan for Armageddon, but you can have them in a reasonably downturn scenarios to make sure they have enough capital to stand on their own two feet. So they're going to get in the games the good times, they'll, they'll take the losses in the bad times. So I think that's been a hallmark of U.S. Uh, financial regulatory efforts. And uh, China's largest banks are state-owned, obviously, majority. They have a, a public uh, minority shareholder base. Um, and uh, it creates a completely different dynamic. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the heads of these large banks are make six figures. You know, I don't, they're, 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 they're public utilities uh, in, in a sense. They're not like the U.S. model where it's, it's for-profit. You're, you're, you're managed to generate shareholder returns within a hopefully prudential framework given the, the social safety net. Uh, programs, the safety net programs you have with deposit insurance and Federal Reserve uh, lending, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think uh, private ownership is better. As I go, I think credit, the private sector is, does a better job of making credit decisions and in, in capital resource allocation. 
but you know, even Adam Smith and Milton Friedman said you've got to regulate the financial sector. I mean, it's just you know, you got to you know, it's just the nature of the beast. You've got to have some common sense regulation, particularly strong capital requirements, because those safety net programs will create incentives to take on a lot of leverage. Um, so again, I think it's it's up to us to prove the model we have here. I want to prove the model we have here. I believe in the model we have here. But that means that we've got to particularly have a strong enough capital base for our banks to be resilient in, in normal economic downturns. And, and that's why I'm very concerned about, as, as Stan mentioned, some of the political pressure and direction we're going now to weaken those uh, requirements. Yes, please, Stan. I, I think uh, it's inevitable that it will appear to be um, they get the ups the, the private sector gets the upside and the public sector gets the uh, downside because of a particular feature of a, f of, of a uh, fiat money system, which is that the central the, the central bank is typically a governmental organization and in the crisis the ultimate demand is for credit and the only credit that people are willing to accept at those stages are typically government credit. That doesn't mean, however, that those people who took ba big bets and lost them should emerge whole. And they should, the, one of the big surprises to me in this crisis was I was sure, and I've said this here before, so I'm safe because I escaped last time. Um, <laughs> is that I'm amazed that the bankers got away very lightly in terms of uh, the way the b blame was assigned and what the returns people got from their uh, job, so to speak, during the middle of the crisis. And so you don't have to have those people come out ahead in the middle of the crisis, or you can do it later. But you you sh you should not provide a set of initiatives which says go ahead go go ahead nothing will happen to you it should be go ahead we'll rescue your firm we will not rescue you personally. Thank you, Stan. That was a point worth repeating. Um, is there someone else who would like to question or comment? Please, there in the front row, just. Ozzy Arminovi, Goldman Sachs. Question for Mr. Fisher. To the point of the title of this uh, session on normalization of U.S. interest rates, are you surprised how well emerging market economies and currencies have fared in this rise in U.S. interest rates, especially given the experience with the taper tantrum? Well, I'm not. I, I mean, it's not that I <laughs> thought this was an impossible outcome. I, I was. Uh, I mean, it was something they'd had a lot of time to think about. They had a lot of uh, preparations to make, and so forth. So it was it was clearly a possible outcome. Excuse me. <coughs> it was clearly a possible outcome. Um, if you want to ask, would I have taken a bet against it? Well, tell me the odds, and uh, I'll tell you the answer. But it certainly wasn't obvious that they were going to all, more or less, all come out of this as well as they have so far. <coughs> now, if that breeds overconfidence, we'll, we'll have to see. John or Sheila, anything to add on that? Okay. Next comment or question, please, if you could stand up at the mic. Xinxin <coughs> Li from Observatory Group. I have a question uh, for all the speakers, especially for uh, Chairman Fisherman, Fisher, I'm sorry. Uh, so the you know Chinese government has been uh, advocating uh, or pushing forward a policy campaign of financial deleveraging de in China. So basically that means in the crackdown, shadow banking, and then uh, reduce the financial leverage, especially in the non-bank institutions. So if you were the uh, policy advisors to Chinese government to Chinese leaders, uh, what's your advice? How can they deliver? What's the best and what's the optimum policy combination? between monetary policy and uh, financial regulation or macroprudential policies. Thank you. Me? <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in. <laughs> I'm paying for penance for my phone. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, I think some of this uh, restructuring they're doing in China, as I understand it, is, is designed just to deal with that problem. So the People's Bank of China now has 
rule writing authority uh, for, for issues of uh, rules of system-wide impact. They're consolidating some of their regulators. Um, I think uh, the again the combination the merger of CBRC and CIRC I think was specifically targeted with with some of the gaps that occurred between insurance and bank regulation which facilitated the marketing of some consumer deposit what were essentially uh, looked and acted and felt like bank deposits but didn't have any of the backing uh, that the banking system would provide so I, I think they are dealing with that already. Um, I do think on the financial technology side this is a, a particular uh, challenge for them. Uh, you want to make sure that if you know if you're performing a banking function, you need to have capital behind it. I just I, I'm sorry, but capital is really important for financial stability. Whoever is providing uh, that function, and uh, some of the fintechs that are getting into this do not have a capital base to support some of the activities uh, they want to get into. So, I think this is a challenge uh, for China. I think they recognize that's a challenge. I think that's been driving a lot of the regulatory changes. They are making, uh, but, it, but it's not unique to China. It's, we, we've got the same issue coming in the U.S. too. And again, I think that it would be a good area of collaboration between our two countries. John, just to slightly push you, um, as a private sector financial actor, how do you feel in general terms about a sort of Chinese approach where you are consolidating regulators and putting them largely under the central bank versus a U.S. FSOC-like approach where it's multiple regulators who have a coordinating role in crises. I mean, in general, does this matter to you? Does it depend on the regulators? What's the more efficient way from your perspective? Well, um, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer. I think the the important component, um, I think, for us or for b businesses that operated within re regulatory frameworks is to have a consistent regulatory framework across the different regulators from the different people. Um, I think, you know, I think that, you know, and I think one of the trends potentially um, in regulation uh, currently is sort of the sort of more bespoke regulation based on business model and risk characteristics. And so that type of framework is a much uh, better framework is trying to get everyone to line up in a, in a row and look and, and act the same way. But I think the tenets of capital liquidity uh, resolution are all very important components of that. And, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is not capital levels and liquidity levels because they're clearly higher and they as they should be uh, given where we were 10 years ago, but just sort of the, the overlapping and sometimes contradictory complexity of some of those uh, organizations and what they're each trying to accomplish. Thank you. Uh, uh, Adam, if I could, uh, could add something. I, I don't think you can decide whether it should be in one institution or 15 institutions without knowing something about the uh, history of the country. I mean, the Swedes have had a debt office for 200 years or something. There's not a heck of a lot of point in putting that together with the central bank. They both seem to do their job well. Uh, if you were setting them up and you, you might not choose that. So I think that you need to take into account how well institutions cooperate in your uh, in in each relevant country. Yes, and this will be the final question for this session. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca Patterson, Bessemer Trust. I I'm wondering, as we think about the Chinese uh, financial sector and opening up and internationalizing it is our capital controls in China a binding constraint? Is it something that limits their ability to grow and become more international? And, and Sheila, particularly from where you've been saying the conversations you have, are the Chinese officials or executives you're speaking with thinking about that? Is that a consideration for them? Um, well, I, I'm not speaking for any institutions. I'll just, my own uh, personal view, I, I think, uh, um, The capital controls have been a challenge, definitely. Um, I think more for um, the, uh, maybe on more on the customer side than the, the banking institution side. Uh, I understand why they've got them in place, but I think that they're very difficult. They do um, skew, uh, hinder certain types of transactions. And uh, so, um, you know, it, but it's it's a balancing. I wouldn't want to second guess the Chinese government on that. I understand the problem they're trying to tackle, but I do think uh, there is, it's problematic in terms of 
um, inter certain international transactions. Uh, and uh, again, more from the customer perspective that makes things difficult. Yeah, I, I don't think there are any totally, totally waterproof uh, capital controls. Sometimes it's nice not to get drowned, only get damp, right? I mean, no, but, but that's because it's then there's a lot of bureaucracy around it because it's so you know it's so hard to control it, so that it makes it creates a lot of hassle. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, just I've been monitoring the Twitter feed, not not playing games on my phone, um, and we are continuing to get good engagement in that sphere as well. We are taking a lesson from the Chinese uh, People's Congress that um, breaks between presentations are for disloyal wimps. Um, so we will we will be going right in. Some of you understand what I'm referring to. Um, we will be going right into the next session. the The next session will be moderated by Zhao Yuan. Forgive my pronunciation. Um, this is on the structural aspects of the U.S.-China imbalance and includes Jason Furman, Nicholas Lardy, Jin Yong Kai, and Yin Yang. Uh, following that, and I may let you have a break after that one, uh, Carla Hills will moderate a panel on China as the global investor with Zhang Tao from the IMF giving a presentation and then comments from Jason Cummins, Teng Wei, and Gao Zhangjin. If I could ask, uh, Zhao Yuan to come up, please, and thank you to our panelists. and pleasure of moderating the second panel. Uh, so for those of you who want to hear my views on trade dispute, on investment issues, and on the transformation of the US policies from an economic policy targeting China to a you know uh, industrial policy uh, angle and to a geopolitical angle, uh, feel free to contact me by email. Uh, I'll read this aloud, P-H-E-L-E-X at Gmail. P-H-E-L-E-X at Gmail. So I'm not going to share my views, but instead I'm going to moderate today's uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, some of the panel members I've known for like 30 years, like Mr. Tsai, uh, who is going to be the first to speak. Uh, he, uh, before his... Uh, uh, before he joined um, TPG, right, as partner, focusing on infrastructure investments on the Belt and Road region, he uh, principally, uh, he was the head of Goldman Sachs for many years, and uh, in that capacity, we got to know each other pretty well. 
uh, I was once his customer, a very happy one. Um, Mr. Furman, uh, we've met just uh, t uh, 30 seconds ago. <laughs> but we're off to a good start. <laughs> good start. Yes, uh, instead of reading out his resume, I'm just going to you know, ma mention that he is uh, a uh, Anthony Solomon Senior Fellow at the P Peterson Institute for, I was uh, sorry, it's the, pra <laughs> I'm, re I'm reading Nick, Nick, reading, Professor Lardy, uh, Professor of Practice for Economic Policy at Harvard University, uh, where we have uh, many friends there. Uh, Nick Lardy uh, joined the, the Institute, uh, Peterson Institute, by the way, which was founded by Pete Peterson, as you both know, as you all know, and uh, he, uh, I, I was told that uh, he sold many of his shares to CIC when uh, Blackstone went public, and uh, and he, you know, which gave him the freedom to, you know, set up this uh, very distinguished research institute. And we, I think, the world is going to hear more of the research results of of this place. This is a unsolicited uh, commercial for Peterson Institute. And finally, In Yung. Uh, you know, his resume is long, and uh, uh, but he's been primarily focusing for the, you know, uh, on the management of China's foreign reserve, which at the peak of his time surpassed the $4 trillion, the size of which was matched only by the size of the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve balance sheet. In 2009, in two, in two, 2009 uh, you know, uh, we were told by the central bank governor at the time uh, that it was going to be surpassing one trillion dollars, and the quantitative easing was probably going to stop where, right where where it was. But it went on to balloon to its current size, and the U.S. Uh, um, central bank is going to downsize that as far, largely expected. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass the panel to, to Jin Yong, and each panelist is going to be speaking for five to six minutes, and the rest of the time, uh, total of 50 minutes, will be uh, reserved for, for questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, given my uh, background, I, I want to uh, spend the next five to six minutes touch upon a couple of issues has been pretty much in the center of debate uh, not only on the trade, but more of a broader U.S.-China relationship. One is uh, state-owned companies in China. The second is the, um, what I call, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, industrial policy China manufacturing 2025. I, I talk about these two uh, subjects from my personal uh, kind of a involvement experience. And uh, I was trained as an economist, but I'm not practicing, I'm more of a practitioner. So state-owned companies has always been kind of a uh, viewed from the U.S. perspective as one of the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, TPP particularly trying to keep uh, China out, mainly because of uh, SOE. And it was viewed as a uh, kind of a Chinese political uh, government political tools and uh, and also have uh, other objectives be besides uh, uh, business. I uh, I would say the this conventional view to a large extent I think is wrong. I think state-owned companies in China came into the being because of China has to find a unique path to develop the economy. I, uh, I talk about this, I mentioned earlier, I was in CICC, I was the first, one of the first employees in CICC. When we started the business in 1995, and there was very, there were literally no state-owned companies, and it was all the Ministry of Petroleum, Ministry of Post and Telecom, and Ministry of Armor Industry, so on and so forth. So the key, you have to look at the Chinese practice, and the China, China's economy can reach today's uh, scale, and uh, prosperity enable the uh, Chinese consumers and the country to become a you know, second largest economy with all this purchasing power to a large extent because of the uh, government has adopted a very pragmatic and uh, market-driven approach to turn 
I don't know, lost count how many ministries into each of the companies China has today. I'm not saying the current business model will continue for the future, but I think I compare the experience China had, uh, under, uh, has had under the policy has undertaken over the, over the last 20 some years, vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries, took the uh, advice on shock therapy, create a, I don't know how many oligarchs, how many uh, private companies. When you look at, compare these two approach, I cannot help but, but not to mention that uh, in terms of inclusive growth, in, in terms of create a foundation for economic competitiveness, I can't think of a better way to deal with, uh, to, to uh, accomplish those goals. I'll give you a couple of exa uh, examples, a couple of numbers. China right now has about between 40, 42% of world fiber. So people talk a lot about, you know, kind of a China FinTech, this and that, without the state-owned companies deploy the largest fiber network in the world. I do not believe Alibaba, Tencent, and others can function as the way it is. China also achieved literally 100% electrification, and this was done in a very short period of time. I remember uh, when I came to America in 83, 84, blackouts is pretty often, and clearly China has another problem, the overcapacity on power, but all in all, in terms of the manufacturing, uh, capability in terms of uh, competitiveness without this type of infrastructure, I don't think China can ever achieve what they has accomplished today. And uh, clearly, state-owned company as is, is not, cannot uh, behave as is because there, there are more uh, reform need to be done. But right now, kind of uh, without looking at the history and uh, basically saying this is a uh, wrong thing to do to have SOE, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's accurate reflecting the development path China has taken. And uh, so I was thinking what will be the next step for SOE? I think they need to be much more put on the level of the playing field. And, and eventually uh, SOE might be the wealth created. You know, someone mentioned about the socialized gain should be transferred to the uh, uh, social, social Security Trust Fund to really uh, deal with the aging uh, population issue China has, which is underfunded. So that's the first subject I want to talk about. Second subject on China manufacturing 2025, you know, it's very hard to just watch the TV uh, in the US. Is really the trade dispute, or is it really uh, because of this industrial policy document? And uh, there's anxiety, we need to put China down. I'll, but I'll give you one example, I'm sitting on a uh, company's board, and this is why I, I think this is very important for China to figure out what will be the next thing to do to continue to create the wealth, to be part of a global value chain. Uh, I'll give you one example, the iPhone, iPhone 10. You know, I happened to be last week in China, attend a board meeting on, on this semiconductor company. iPhone 10 is about $1,000 sold in the market here. And uh, at the gate to the US, it's about $500. And the, the $500 really in the marketing design, whatever, stay in the US. And uh, when you look at that $500 from China, from nothing to, to the gate, China basically take about $100. And that $400 primarily coming from, I don't know if you know, right now I'm learning this, the most expensive part of the iPhone is the, the screen. That's South Korea made. And there are about 20 some chips and the pretty much uh, Taiwan, Korea, and some Japanese. So that's iPhone. Yes, $500 reached the shore of US, but represent, I would say, the high tech, the value add, the big piece of value add from Japan, Korea, and other Asian countries. The Chinese basically take the sweat, capital, and labor, get about $100. And so in a way, China cannot keep doing that business given the income level because labor costs are getting higher. Have to find a way to move forward. And so that's the basis for you know, why China has this, uh, this industrial policy. So I don't have much time to elaborate, but I will tell you the, you know, the measures taken in that regard, very much trying to improve the 
uh, overall market uh, capability in the uh, value chain. And uh, in doing that, actually, a lot of new jobs will be created, not only in China, also in other Asian countries. Thank you. Please, uh, uh, Jason. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And, and I did want to expand on my bio to include a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. Um, wanted to talk about the um, past and future of rebalancing in the United States and China. Um, there's all these trade discussions going on, and there's all these different tariff lines. And I'm sure if I understood all these different tariff lines, I I could get myself even more excited about it um, than I already am. Um, but one of the stated objectives of the United States appears to be um, the bilateral trade balance with China. And as everyone who knows enough macroeconomics to pass the test to get the free food at Peterson events would know, um, <laughs> that's not something that really has very much at all to do with tariffs or all of what's under discussion. Um, in these trade discussions, it's really primarily um, something macroeconomic. And in the last decade, um, the world has seen a narrowing of external imbalances. And the two big contributors to that rebalancing, the two countries that have done the most to help it happen, in, um, were the two countries that were the worst malefactors um, a decade ago, um, the United States and China. Um, the United States and China, both around 2006, 2007, depending upon which country um, you look at, reach the peak in terms of their imbalances. In China's case, of course, it was a surplus of around 10% of GDP on the current account. In the United States, it was a deficit of around 6% of GDP on the current account. And both countries have steadily improved. Um, China now has a reported current account surplus of 1.4% of GDP. Um, one might want to adjust for some of the alleged um, tourist purchases that may be disguised capital outflows. But that adjustment isn't going to change that story very much. Um, the United States has a current account um, deficit still. Um, our deficit is 2.4% of GDP. So it's also um, come down. In looking at the two of those, you could argue that China, as an emerging economy with high productivity growth, should be running a smaller current account surplus or even a current account deficit, given all of the opportunities there. Um, but whatever you think the right equilibrium level is, China's gotten a lot closer to it. Um, and the United States, too, um, you could argue um, that you know, notwithstanding our exorbitant privilege and the high rate of return we get on our gross foreign assets relative to foreign investment in the United States, that 2.4% of GDP is, you know, towards the upper bound of what we'd be comfortable with over the long term. Um, certainly not way too high. Um, that's what's happened. Um, now let's look at the next chapter. No matter how the trade fight ends, the U.S. budget deficit will go up from 3% of GDP to 5% of GDP. The U.S. private savings is, personal savings, is nearly the lowest it's ever been as a share of disposable personal income. And so net national savings in the United States looks set to be falling, potentially even by 2% of, of GDP. Um, at the same time, um, investment as a share of GDP, I think, is likely to rise for two reasons. One is a cyclical rebound from a period of slow investment growth that tends to be followed by fast investment growth, reflective of the increased strengthening of the global economy and the functioning of an accelerator. Um, and second, and um, to a lesser degree, but I think still a positive for investment, is the tax law that we passed in the United States last year. Taken together, investment, I think, plausibly could rise by 1% of GDP, possibly even more. So you're talking about a potential 3% of GDP increase in the U.S. current account deficit. Um, that's much larger than the IMF is forecasting. They're forecasting a 1% of GDP. Um, they might be right. I might be right. Um, the sign is the most important. Um, China is looks 
like it has been on a steady track um, to continue to increase, de decrease its current account surplus. So as the United States is going to be widening its global imbalances, heading back towards where it was, it appears that China is making progress. Um, part of that is that China has one of the most enviable economic adjustments to make of any country in global history, which is that everyone goes there and tells them they need faster consumption growth. Normally, you tell countries they need slower um, consumption growth, and that's why um, Chinese consumption growth has held up even as GDP growth has slowed, which means the share of consumption in GDP has risen, and um, savings has fallen steadily from 52% of GDP to 46% of GDP over the last seven years, um, and the IMF expects a similar pace of about one percentage point per year um, over the next several years. Um, at the same time, China's very high investment rate, possibly too high for anyone um, to be able to allocate rationally, peaked in 2011. Um, it's been coming down. Um, it has been coming down as well, um, but coming down more slowly than savings has, thus the projection for a narrowing imbalance. So we could be going forward as we look at these imbalances in the awkward position that having nothing to do with any country's trade policies, um, the United States has a larger current account deficit. China has a smaller current account deficit and will be trying to figure out how tariffs on soybeans and solar panels can solve these imbalances, um, possibly without success. Um, the, the last thing um, I'd say is, separate from these uh, the external balance issues, there's also just the issues of the overall level. And here, um, the United States has, in some ways, a slight advantage over China. Um, if you look at the population age 25 to 54, a big source of the slowdown in GDP growth in the United States has been that the growth of that population, which is where the bulk of the workforce is, has slowed um, dramatically. The growth of that population is going to continue to be slow, but going to rise a little bit. Um, China's also seen a slowdown in that, but its demographic changes are going to be um, much further um, than ours to the point where that prime age population is contracting by a percentage point um, a year. And in that regard, um, you know, how China continues to carry out this rebalancing in a world where you know, we can't ever predict productivity, but you can predict demography, and demography will continue to be um, a downdraft on Chinese growth over the, the coming period is going to be um, you know, important to watch how that ends up getting um, navigated. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, pr Professor Hardy. Well, uh, one of the questions that was posed uh, to the panelists is uh, why has the world perspective, and maybe particularly the U.S. perspective on China, changed over the years, uh, and particularly maybe in the last five years? And my perspective is very simple. I think the first 35 years of reform in China were marked by the gradual rise of the market and increasing importance of private business. Uh, starting from nothing, uh, by five years ago, private companies were producing two-thirds of GDP, and they were responsible for all the growth of employment uh, that had occurred between 78 and roughly five years ago. China opened up to foreign investment, it joined the WTO, and increasingly was seen as complying with uh, international standards in a variety of different domains. I think in the last five years, we've seen a substantial erosion in the role of the market in private business and the increasing dominance of the state in uh, resource allocation. Uh, I think it's driven in part by President Xi Jinping's continuous and repeated admonition that state-owned enterprises must become bigger and better. Uh, as a result of this, the share of credit flowing to state companies has more than doubled since 2011. Relative to state investment, uh, private investment uh, slowed down starting in 2012. And in 2016 and 2017, private investment collapsed. Uh, and partly because of the chilling of, um, partly this was a result of the crowding out because of the change in the allocation of credit through the state-owned uh, banking system.
but partly the collapse of private investment was due to the chilling effect of a very substantial, apparently very substantial amount of expropriation, illegal confiscation of private property. Uh, this does not get reported in the Chinese press, but the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee in 2016 put out a statement claiming, stating that private property rights needed to be protected and treated according, uh, according to the laws. So when the Central Committee thinks something is that important, uh, I suspect that the, the extent of private property confiscation appropriation is significant. It came up again at the press conference uh, at the end of the National People's Congress a, uh, a few weeks ago. Li Keqiang, was the, the premier, was asked uh, by a Chinese <coughs> journalist, why is private investment so weak now? And the answer, he said, and this is a direct quote, because of inadequate protection of private property rights. Um, so I think that's, that's another way that the environment has changed in recent years. And finally, of course, for this audience, I don't need to point to the very increasingly, I would say, aggressive use of industrial policy that appears to discriminate against foreign firms. Obviously, uh, the Made in China 2025, uh, which identified 10 key industries in 2015, then the 13th five-year plan announced uh, the following year that had more details for about six, uh, six important uh, sectors. Uh, the consequences for the Chinese economy of this change uh, are that first, state companies have gotten a great deal larger. The assets, for example, of the companies this, that are administered by this organization we call SASIC, the State uh, Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, <laughs> Uh, their assets are 10 times larger than they were 10 years ago. They're about 55 trillion RMB. But they have not, these, these companies have not gotten better. The return on assets of these companies has roughly declined from around 7% to about 2.5%. It's just been steady downhill as they've, ex as they've merged more and more of these companies. Uh, the number of companies has been cut in half through mergers. So per company, the assets are 20 times larger than they were at the beginning of this process, and the return on assets has gone down by about three-fifths. So what are, we were also asked to talk about structural adjustments that are needed. I think in China, the kind of structural adjustments that we need are the imposition of hard budget constraints on state enterprises. Um, the Ministry of Finance in China, which should know what the actual situation is, reports that 45% of all state-owned companies have lost money every year for the last 10 years. And the amount of money they lost in the last year is eight times what it was 10 years ago. <clears throat> so a subset of these companies is losing uh, more and more money. So there, need to, there needs to be the imposition of hard budget constraints on, on, on these enterprises. <clears throat> Secondly, I would say China has to allow much more market-oriented merger and acquisition activity. Almost all the mergers that take place in China are these top-down things where f these big state companies are, are merged together uh, uh, under the SASIC uh, organization. There's very little market-oriented, opportunistic merger and, ac merger and acquisition activity where a more efficient firm sees an opportunity to use uh, assets more efficiently uh, if they can acquire them. And then I think thirdly, uh, in which we are seeing a little bit, hopefully, the opening up of the financial system to foreign banks, securities firms, asset managers, and so forth, to increase competition in the banking and financial system more generally and improve, uh, improve the allocation of capital. I think if these things were done, China would grow faster than we've seen in recent years. I think it's growing below potential. Uh, it could be growing at 7 to 8 percent instead of 6 to 7 percent if they could reduce the drag of uh, state-owned companies on the economy. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, um, stating Vice Mayor uh, Yin Yong, uh, it's your turn, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I didn't realize that I have such a freedom in terms of choosing the topic I would like to talk at the very beginning, because I was told that I need to uh, talk about something about the uh, controversial topic of the uh, trade dispute between China and the U.S. Uh, I, I just uh, flew in from New York where I uh, met with some old friends in the Wall Street. I think that uh, during each meeting, uh, the trade disputes uh, were definitely the topic uh, between us. 
uh, I would like to uh, contribute a little bit more comments uh, on this topic. Uh, I think that currently our focus when we talk about the uh, uh, friction of the trade, uh, we focus mainly on the bilateral trade number. Uh, for example, in the, na in the last year, uh, the trade deficit of uh, American uh, came in, coming from China uh, was around uh, 337 billion US dollars, uh, which uh, accounts for, uh, for example, 59% uh, of the total US deficit. Uh, but I would like to say this is probably not the panorama, uh, because in the whole world, besides US and China, there is a third party, that is the rest of the world. So if we look at the picture from the, this holistic point of view, we will find something that are probably slightly different. Uh, for example, uh, let's firstly look at the trade deficit in terms of the goods and the services together. Uh, so uh, to this extent, I think that the US on that is the uh, deficit contributor to the China plus the rest of the world. Uh, the headline number uh, was uh, 570 billion US dollars in last year. Uh, so among them, China uh, was the uh, surplus country. Uh, the headline number was uh, 211 billion US dollars. And uh, the rest of the world uh, is also a net contributor of the surplus, uh, which is uh, the headline uh, was around 300. 60 billion US dollars. So the big picture is like this. China uh, takes only 37% uh, of the share of the US trade deficit. And uh, the rest of the world uh, takes 63% of the share of the US trade deficit. Uh, so uh, why this methodology is uh, more a reflection of the, tr uh, tr the, 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 the truth because we know that there is a very long supply chain uh, uh, coming from the globalization. And the U.S. Uh, is at the end flow, end stream of this chain, the final user of the uh, goods and the services in the world. And the China, unfortunately, is also at the very end of the chain, just next to the U.S. So uh, the bilateral number between China and the U.S. in terms of the deficit, uh, I think includes also a significant part of the surpluses come from the upchain, upstream. Uh, so when we look at the three parties together, uh, we can see that the uh, imbalance in terms of the trade and uh, in terms of the uh, trade of goods and services. Uh, between China and the U.S. is not as huge as people generally talk about. Uh, so that's uh, one observation. If we use the same methodology to look at the trade in goods and trade in services separately, we will also have some interesting findings. Uh, for example, for the trade in goods, uh, U.S. obviously on that contribute to the uh, deficit, uh, which is around 800 billion US dollars is quite huge. And among them, China uh, takes a share of 60% and the rest of the world uh, takes the share of around 40%. Then when we look at the trade in services, it, this time it's China who contributes to the uh, deficit to the US plus the rest of the world. Uh, the headline number of the net deficit is uh, 270 billion US dollars. Among them, US took a takes a share of 86%, and the rest of the world only takes a share of 14%. What does it mean? I think at least it's a reflection that in terms of the US and China in the global picture of the trade, we each have exerted our competitive advantages. China is good at manufacturing, and the U.S. is very much competitive, even more com com competitive than China in goods. Uh, that is, U.S. is very much good at services. 
So this is exactly the result that the trade theory would like to tell us, would like to ask us to, uh, to achieve in the real world. So I think it's a wonderful mixture of the, uh, of the uh, global trading system. So if I could, I would like to simply comment on the a few, few, few points on how, to, how we can further improve the trade situation if we view there is indeed some imbalances. I think that the trade war is definitely the loose, loose solution uh, because the current supply chain uh, is chosen by the market. So are any artificial adjustment will be suboptimal. And the US as the end user of this uh, chain, it will probably uh, pay a little bit more cost. Uh, so uh, there, there are some calculations. Uh, last year, Oxford Economics made some calculations. Uh, they found out that uh, on average, uh, buying Chinese goods uh, save a typical American family around $850 a year using 2015 as an example. So that's uh, my first point. The second point is that we, China could input more and the U.S. could export more. Uh, so Chinese ag input growth rate has been five, pay, five percentage points higher than the export rate in the past two to three years. But at the same time, we also look that the U.S. could loosen its export control. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peacement also made a very interesting calculation. They found they, the, the result shows that if U.S. could treat, treat China uh, as France, the bilateral trade deficit could be shrink by up to 34%. And if U.S. could treat China as Brazil, then the trade deficit between us could be shrink, uh, shrunk by up to 24%. And even U.S. could treat China like what it did in 20 years ago. That means rolling back the control to the level in 1998, the deficit could be shrunk up to 17%. So China looks to more imports uh, from U.S. The third point, the last, is that uh, obviously from my former calculations, we should strive together to encourage to growth the trade in services because this is more promising than the goods. Uh, China service sector is right now 52% uh, of the GDP uh, with still huge potential uh, to improve because on average in the world is 70% and for the mature economies is 80% of the GDP share. So if we can further improve in terms of serv uh, uh, trade in services, then I have a very promising picture that the China and the U.S. trade balances will be much more easily balanced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the four speakers uh, made a comment on a wide variety of subjects. And let me just summarize some of the points made. Vice Mayor uh, made a point that uh, in, in terms of understanding the U.S.-China um, you know, trade picture, we should, one, take the triangularization of uh, international trade into the picture, Namely, that you know, China imports the parts from the U.S., from you know, Korea, from Japan, and Taiwan, and assemble these products and send them back to the U.S. When the U.S., however, you know, manufactures the, the machinery that will be making these parts, uh, he also mentioned that uh, you know, the services should be counted into the total you know, current account uh, picture, and uh, you know, further balancing can be achieved if China tries to buy more and the U.S. tries, uh, to, buy, tries to sell more. Uh, and I think there's room for improvement. Uh, I think you know, Mr. Tsai jun Yu agrees with the triangular, triangular picture uh, of international trade by making a comment that China actually is at the tail end of the uh, value chain, making very little uh, in terms of uh, the, um, you know, the assembly value added. Um, you know, Mr. Furman made a very lucid and very insightful comment on the rebalancing act that are happening on both sides of the Pacific, uh, with the U.S. Uh, you know continuing uh, to scale 
hopefully you will need to scale back its, its, uh, its deficit. And with China, uh, you know, um, it's almost a must, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the point of increasing its domestic consumption, which uh, will lead to a more healthy economy, you know, moving forward. Professor Lardy, um, you know, uh, gave us a picture as to the recent changes in the public sector and private sector in China, and has ma made the recommendation that uh, if China was to take measures to encourage pri private sectors to grow faster and make more, if, if because the private sector is able to make more efficient asset allocation uh, decisions in their in managing their businesses, China's economy could not only become more balanced, but will also release its uh, untapped, you know, growth potential. So we have about 10 minutes. Uh, we are going to entertain maybe five or six questions. Uh, you know, the previous rule of, applies. State your name and your organization and um, make your point succinctly. Yes, please, uh, that lady. And the, the, the next one, you know, the young lady uh, in black. And do we have a third one, please? Yes, the third one. Um, Lyric Hughes-Hale with uh, David Hale Global Economics and EconView in Chicago. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. Wide variety of views here. Very good perspec uh, perspective. Nick, if I understand what you're saying, um, China is not open for private business within China, let alone to U.S. private business. Um, so that makes me worried structurally that national champions might not um, crowd out U.S. companies and foreign companies trying to take part in the Chinese economy. And my second question is for um, uh, Deputy Mayor Ying, who was on the PBOC board before. So the obvious answer is if things do proceed in a way that we would not like them to proceed, wouldn't, no one has mentioned devaluation of the yuan, wouldn't that be an obvious policy tool to protect Chinese exporting companies in a country where those companies are being protected by the government? Thank you. So, Professor Lardy, would you take the first question? Well, I think I think um, I think you've understood my point fairly well. I think that there has been pressure on the private sector in China, both the indigenous private sector and the and the foreign sector. Uh, it's particularly obvious in the case of the indigenous sector because of their being crowded out on uh, access to finance. It it was it was it was improving dramatically in the 90s and the early to, uh, in the first decade of the 2000s and then uh, turned around. Um, and the expropriation, at least foreign firms are not yet facing expropriation, although most of them are reporting that uh, the operating environment has, shall we say, become more difficult, uh, as has been shown in many surveys. So I think it is, again, I don't, uh, can't say with 100% confidence, but it seems to me this all traces back to Xi Jinping. This started when he came into office, and he is the one that says we must rely more on state-owned enterprises. We must create national champions. Our state companies must become bigger and better. Um, so I think that's that's the tone at the top, and I think it filters down. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I hope that I could be a little bit more flexible in terms of talking about the RMB exchange rate since I'm not again on the board of PPOC. Uh, I think the exchange rate, the currency itself is uh, uh, manifest that China and the US could even uh, cooperate on the hard topics like uh, currencies. Uh, so as you know that uh, since 2005, the RMB has appreciated about 35% against the US dollar and 50% uh, against the basket of the currencies in terms of the real effective exchange rate. Uh, and you also probably have uh, witnessed that uh, uh, since 2013, renminbi has been under the pressure of depreciation. And the Chinese government has spent a quarter of its FX reserves uh, to prevent uh, the exchange rate from the uh, irrational devaluation uh, pressures. Uh, so one observation from this time period is that even the dollar exchange rate, dollar to renminbi exchange rate uh, was to some extent artificially depressed. The 
trade deficit between China and the U.S. Uh, hasn't got better. In fact, during the same time period, this deficit number uh, grew by another 18 percent. So it tells us that exchange rate itself is not the answer which can explain the trade deficit between China and the U.S. So we should look at something else which is probably more fundamental than that. Thank you. Yes, uh, could you give the uh, microphone to the lady in black? Um, I'm Zhang Qi, a U.S. correspondent with Cai Xin. Uh, so I've heard a lot about criticism about Made in China 2025 in the U.S. I'm just wondering if there's any um, legitimacy you would think in this industry policy as, you know, every country was, wants to be dominant in cutting edge technologies and U.S. wants to as well, wants to maintain that um, position as well. And also like Germany has industrial uh, industrialization 4.0 industry policy. So I'm just wondering the legitimacy. Uh, and also, do you think the, car the call of the current uh, U.S.-China trade tensions is more about a market economy issue, fairness issue, or more of a competition issue? Thank you. Who would you like to address your question? Uh, I think Jason and Nicholas. Okay. I'll just say. I'm sorry, they, they oh. just went. Oh, sorry. It's a slip I'll, in I'll say. Uh, yeah. I'll just say very briefly. I mean, I think one can debate whether industrial policy is a good thing or a bad thing for a country to um, undertake, and whether it's done well or badly. Um, there's ways to do it that are consistent with international norms and in international rules and commitments of the WTO, and there's ways to do it that aren't consistent with that. And on a lot of these issues, China seems to do it in a combination of um, both of those ways. And so I think the complaints, not just from the United States, but frankly from most of the global community, um, about some of you know the ways in which you know domestic laws aren't applied, you know antitrust laws, for example, aren't applied neutrally but are applied differently for foreign countries than uh, companies and domestic companies. I think that's a very legitimate complaint. If China wants to spend more on R&D and artificial intelligence, go ahead. In fact, I think the United States would benefit from China spending more on R&D and AI just as, as China would. Yes, Nick? Well, I, ba I basically agree with what Jason uh, said. The, there are good and bad ways of going about industrial policy. My only comment is if you start reading through any significant portion of the report that was put out uh, in connection with this 301 investigation, and there's page after page, hundreds of pages, about all the terrible things that China has been doing, I only have one question. Why haven't we been bringing cases in the WTO if, they're, if, they're, if it's this bad? Okay. Yeah, okay. Can I just, uh, yeah, uh, you know, there are a lot of allegations, right? The uh, manufacturing 2025, exactly that's the point. That the challenge China has really articulate why it wants to do it. I have not seen a, I mean, I'm not seeing China's perfect. There are a lot of issues, you know, particularly uh, on foreign investment, invested companies. The truth I see it, I, this lady mentioned, is really competition. You mentioned about state-owned companies' return has been low. Actually, the private sector the investment also went lower. What had happened is, uh, you know, people forgot right after financial crisis, the world applauded China to do a stimulus. I mean, all this overcapacity competition really started from there. And uh, you know, four trillion RMB in China basically injecting the economy three months, an additional twelve trillion, and that has created overcapacity competition. I have to say, I have to deal with a lot of. Um, both Chinese private uh, foreign companies, I uh, even felt even the state-owned companies, things are getting tougher. It's about much more competitive. You can't make as much profit as before, and there are, you know, certain issues become much more pronounced than before. Thank you. Um, the last question, please. So, so uh, I'd like to turn the same question uh, I'm Robert Lawrence. Uh, uh, I'm from Harvard University. I'm also a non-resident uh, senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Mm -hmm. I would like to turn the question around to our Chinese colleagues uh, about manufacturing 2025. Okay. Uh, 
Um, and I want to ask it in the following way. We're going to have a session um, in a moment on China's foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, you to um, answer my question, which is, is it compatible for China, on the one hand, to be following Manufacturing 2025, which seeks to effectively close the Chinese market to foreign participation on a large scale, and at the same time become a global uh, leader and engage and integrate with the rest of the world. Okay, uh, you so want the two Chinese, yes. uh, well, Jin Yong, are you Chinese or American? Uh, I'm a Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think okay. that, that, that's a wrong... He's the most Americanized Chinese and the most Chinese of all but Americans. American American, that's the... <laughs> but, but, Which is uh, like that, saying that, that Trump a... is the most real estate savvy president of the United States and the most politically savvy real estate tycoons. I, I think the professor, I don't think the Chinese is so illogical to be, to, you know, that's a characteriz characterization of manufacturing 2025 20, 20, in a way media and a lot of competitors feel, okay? I will tell you, I have read that carefully. There's never said, there are certain, you know, guidelines on what they, they target is which so-called domestic contents, right? But if you look at the world, Brazil, every country has domestic content. And so China is not saying, well, you know, in practice, I will tell you, I'm doing a transaction in Brazil. Basically, everything has to be made, made in Brazil. So, so what I'm saying is, look, the, it's very, it's impossible to be so illogical for Chinese saying, okay, I close the door and I can go to other countries, right? It just, it, it's illogical. I don't believe that's the right characterization of this uh, industrial policy paper. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, we're going to let um, Deputy Mayor Yin Yong uh, have the last word on this issue. Thank you. And uh, he, he was, of course, uh, before he joined the municipal government of, of uh, Beijing, he was uh, managing China's largest foreign investment fund, in, in fact, the world's largest pool of liquid investable capital. It's my pleasure to answer <laughs> the question from Robert, because Robert was my professor when I was at Harvard Kennedy School. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, first, I was told by my president that the Chinese manufacturing sector has been almost open. So during his recent announcement of the further uh, opening up of policies, he, he just mentioned about several sectors, including automobile, aircraft, uh, and ship uh, man, uh, manufacturing, the three sectors. That's my understanding uh, to the manufacturing sector. But uh, for the service sector, as I just mentioned, there is huge uh, potential for us to further open up, uh, opening up to the uh, rest of the world. Uh, so for example, we are taking about the further opening up in Beijing municipal government because I'm right now in charge of the job. Uh, we would like to do in the following four dimensions. The first one is subject us against the international standards, trade standards, including the TPP, the RC, as well as the TISA under the WTO agreement. Uh, the second dimension is that we would like to introduce a relatively slim negative interest in the service sector. The third dimension is that we would like to open both to the foreign investors as well as our own domestic private investors in this service sector. And the last one is that we would like to work very hard on the bus doing business environment uh, to provide a, a good incentive for the international investors. So we keep a very open mind uh, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are reaching the end of our session and like to thank everyone in the audience uh, for being attentive to the uh, discussion and thank you, thank you all the members of the panel for your outstanding performance. Thank you very much. <laughs>
still in church. You know what? Well, we'll see. We're about to start the last segment of our program. Hey, Robert. Hi. Greetings. Greetings. Please be seated. Please be seated. seated. <laughs> I think that uh, we've all enjoyed the panels that have uh, preceded. Uh, this one is very special as well. And we're going to have a 15 minute presentation first before the panel. And we're privileged to have as our presenter, uh, Zhang Tao. He assumed the, ro ro uh, the role of Deputy Managing Director of IMF on August 22, 2016, having served for four years as the Deputy Director of the People's Bank of China and IMF's Executive Director of, uh, for China. Mr. Zong brings extensive international economic experience and expertise in policy and about international financial institutions. And prior to his service as deputy governor, he held a number of high level positions in the People's Bank of China as director general of legal affairs department, director general of the international department, and as director general of finance survey and statistics department. Mr. Zhang has also worked for the World Bank 1995 to 1997 and the Asian Development Bank 1997 to 2004. He holds a master's and a doctorate degree in international economics from the University of California, my home state, Santa Cruz, as well as a bachelor's in electrical engineering, wow, and a master's in finance from Tsinghua University in Beijing. And he's going to lead off on the investment issues, and then we will go to the panel. Mr. Zhang, we're honored to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And good afternoon to all of you. It is um, always a pleasure um, to return to Peterson, um, to meet friends and colleagues, um, and of course, very much thank for, uh, for uh, Chai Xing and Peterson in particular, uh, Shuli and Adams um, for inviting me um, to speak today uh, in front of uh, such a, a distinguished uh, audience. So let me uh, start uh, with the latest uh, world economic outlook um, at 3.8%. Um, global growth in two 2017, as you, all of you know, uh, was the uh, fastest um, growth rate since uh, 2011. And global growth is expected um, to accelerate to 3.9% in 2018 and 2019. The key drivers uh, to growth are investment, trade and financial activities. Uh, later on, I think the panel will talk about investment uh, further. Um, and the, uh, geographically, uh, Asia um, remains the engines of the, uh, the world economies by contributing uh, two thirds of the global growth. So growth um, at this uh, broad based uh, scale and strong uh, has not been seen uh, since uh, before the 2008 um, financial crisis. Um, advanced, advanced economies uh, are expected to uh, continue uh, to expand above their potential growth rate this year and the next uh, before uh, decelerating. 
growth in emerging markets and developing countries will rise uh, before leveling off. Um, so our policy makers should see this opportunity to bolster growth, uh, make it more durable, and equip uh, their government uh, to counter the next downturns more uh, effectively. So that's pretty much the messages we want to send and already be included in our most recent uh, wheel, uh, uh, which we uh, released uh, just uh, uh, a week ago. So overall, uh, global growth uh, remains on a positive moment, uh, but the sun shining won't always be there. So looking ahead, fiscal stimulus uh, around the world, including, for example, the, uh, in the uh, major economies such as the US and China, will be phased out, and financial conditions are, are expect, expected to uh, tighten as uh, major uh, central banks are, are begin or already have uh, normalized uh, their uh, poli monetary policies. Uncertainties associated with geopolitical tensions and trade disputes are, of course, the darker uh, cloud uh, loomings uh, on the horizon. Therefore, uh, while we at the IMF remains uh, quite um, optimistic uh, about uh, growth prospect, we call on all the member countries uh, to prepare in good times to face future storms. So at the same time, uh, we noted that the, uh, in per capita terms, uh, growth in more than 40 um, emerging market and developing countries um, continues to lag behind their advanced uh, uh, counterparts. So um, allow me to turn to the second part of my speech, uh, how to move forward from now on. So let me uh, the, um, uh, just quote um, the, uh, our managing director, Christian Lagarde, the recent uh, remarks uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, she was saying, um, fix the roof while the sun shines. This means the government uh, should take advantage of current uh, growth momentum to adopt much needed policies, actions, and reforms, especially in labor market and service sectors. That will make growth more sustainable and more resilient before next downturn. So uh, I think the, uh, that message is the, uh, well known to uh, now to everybody. The current situation should bring a new sense of urgency, I should point it out. Um, so um, again, this drop, um, I see uh, there are three priorities uh, in the medium to long terms we need to address. So first, uh, let us steer clear um, of uh, protectionism. The multilateral rule-based trade systems uh, that evolved after the World War II has n nurtured uh, unprecedented growth. It has transformed the world over the past generations um, and helped reduce by half the proportion of those populations living in extreme poverty. Um, so um, all in all, it reduced cost of living and create millions of the new jobs with higher wages. And of course, the, uh, we have to pay attention for those who, um, you know, we will be called left behind. So, um, but as long as we stick to the uh, rule-based multilateral systems and there will be a effective way to, um, to move forward. Of course, the, um, uh, the, uh, they are, um, you know, the uh, noises and uh, the, uh, some recent development, um, which pretty much reflect the system of the rules and shared responsibilities is now in danger. So as pointed out by Madame Lagarde, uh, this would be a inexcusable collective policy failures if we could not maintain the rule-based um, multilateral um, 
trade and investment systems. So uh, here, um, the IMF urged all the uh, member countries to continue to support the multilateral trade systems and uh, global economies and enhancing collaborations uh, and dialogue uh, with their trade partners uh, and resolving uh, any trade conflict uh, in a constructive and uh, cooperative way. So, and second, we need to guard against the uh, fiscal and financial risks. Um, at, the, at the front, we just uh, released the, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, most recent studies, uh, including the uh, studies on low-income countries and the fiscal monitors um, just uh, this week. And we see that after a decade of a easy financial conditions, global debt, uh, both public and private, uh, had reached a all-time high at uh, $164 trillion, uh, which is pretty much uh, equivalent to 225% of global GDP. And uh, if you compare with the level of the 2007, which is right before the crisis, um, the debt is now 40% higher. So, um, and of course, the, uh, the major drivers uh, of the that build up uh, is, you know, the private sectors, which pretty much account for two thirds of uh, the total uh, debt levels. And if you are speaking of the public debt, and of course, um, all countries share the burdens. Let me start with advanced countries. The public debt in advanced uh, economies uh, is at levels not seen since uh, the Second World War, and, and it now accounts for 73% uh, of the total global debt. And meanwhile, of course, in the emerging market, and public debt also uh, raised uh, sharply. And uh, since 2007, the public debt in emerging market had risen um, up 1.6 times. So. And look, if you look at the low-income countries, uh, nowadays um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, many um, low-income countries now either have unsustainable debt or their debt are at the risk of being uh, unsustainable. So why I say something like this? Um, because these debt burdens um, have left governments and companies and households more vulnerable, uh, particularly to the situations we are facing in the financial um, uh, market as you know, the uh, market policy starts to normalize and financial conditions uh, are expected to be also, uh, if you want to say, tightened or normalized. Um, so the first lines of those who, show, who will show the burdens are those who heavily get into the debt traps. So, um, the message is, uh, let's move now, let's act now to reduce the burdens and build up uh, the policy buffers. And the third priority we have at this moment is try to foster stronger and more inclusive growth. Um, a moment ago, I said the, the trade has benefited in enormously uh, of, across the board, uh, but there are some ones um, who got uh, adverse impacted and job reallocations and so forth. So the um, uh, economic inequalities, debt concerns, um, political uh, polarizations have become more worrying across the board. So um, the message is, is countries need to uh, step up the economic reforms and policies, uh, actions to be taken to boost uh, economic uh, productivities. So how to achieve it? Uh, there are many ways to do it. Here I just want to mention um, two key areas uh, in order to set up the stage for further development later on uh, at the panel. First, um, the, I want to mention the digital economy, um, which could be a potential game changer. So the um, message is countries 
uh, need to seize the opportunities uh, to harness the uh, advantages and potential of digital economies. This can facilitate the digital transformations of public services, events, uh, research, education, and investment uh, activities. Meanwhile, uh, countries need to adopt measures to mitigate and compensate uh, those who face disallocations in as a result of the uh, uh, transformation, including more trainings uh, and job uh, creation. The second area is uh, infrastructure development. As you know, infrastructure development is a key driving force of uh, both actual and potential growth. And this is true to advanced countries. It is even more true for developing countries, um, which often uh, have uh, substantial infrastructure needs. However, infrastructure uh, is useful, but uh, has to be secured in a way uh, to achieve uh, the maximize the, uh, the benefit, but has to be done well. Um, this requires, uh, as a, you know, in principle, it uh, requires uh, sound public um, investment management. Um, I think I had a, a seminars together with uh, Madame uh, Kruger's uh, two years ago in Australia. We, we touch upon these issues, uh, how to move forward. You know, Australia, when, when Australia hosts the G20s, uh, pretty much push for uh, the infrastructure uh, investment. And of course, the uh, sound um, uh, fiscal uh, institutions are crucial. Um, and uh, in order to m better manage the process, one has to ensure the infrastructure needs are met in a financially sustainable manner. So that is uh, to say uh, that the way uh, we need to explore to safeguard uh, the public debt susceptibilities, and of course, uh, which includes the uh, judicious use of the public-private um, partnerships. So um, just in the last uh, uh, few minutes, the, uh, let me uh, conclude, uh, uh, repeat uh, the main messages I want to deliver at this moment. The global expansion, uh, of course, continues um, uh, to gain momentum. But at the same time, the medium-term uh, prospect remains substitute. Um, my key message is that we must work um, to get together uh, to brighten uh, the medium-term uh, outlook, and we must work together. And I firmly believe that an open and rule-based uh, multilateral system is the best way forward uh, for securing the global prosperities and uh, stability that we have to share uh, in this uh, uh, the, you know, the more uh, interlinked and uh, prosper prosperous the world. Okay, with that, I thank you very much and hopefully enjoy the, uh, the, the, the rest of the, uh, the panel discussion. Thank you. the uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, forecasting team. He began his career as assistant professor of economics in, at New York University, taught at Harvard University, and he earned his, uh, his doctorate in economics from Columbia and graduated with honors from Swarthmore. And to his left is uh, Gao 
Jang Jun. And he's the former managing director at CIDIC uh, Securities, a vis visiting scholar at uh, Harvard University. He's worked 20 years at the securities firm, and uh, which is, by the way, the most influential investment firm in, uh, in uh, China. He's a columnist for uh, uh, Chaijing uh, Magazine and uh, re received his doctorate uh, degree in finance and economics from the, Ch from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And uh, to his left is uh, Tung Wat Wei, an executive director and chairman of Ping An Securities Group. He took part in the preparation of licensing the Hong Kong Bridge Investment Limited, and he serves as president of uh, uh, Canadian Oil Company, and between 2007 and 2013, he worked at uh, Pacific Asset Management Company, a subsidiary of China Pacific Insurance Group. And uh, these gentlemen are going to tell you about China as a global investor. And I think we'll just start with you, Jason. So um, I, I think... I think I'm on this panel because uh, of, I uh, appreciate the kind introduction, um, because of my background in um, studying investment. So when I started my career as an academic, my main area of focus was thinking about business investment, various aspects of um, how taxes affect investment, which is a very topical thing today. Um, but generally, the nexus between investment and productivity was something that I, I studied took some of that work to the Federal Reserve Board, where we had uh, some practical interest in obviously what's going on in investment and productivity. What I do now is I think about markets and investing, uh, so I'll probably not talk so much about um, those aspects, but maybe I just wanted to especially concentrate on China and say make a couple high-level observations about investment in, uh, in infrastructure and uh, productivity-enhancing kinds of projects. Um, the first thing I would like to emphasize, and maybe just you know, table setter for the discussion, is the, the first thing is that the public and private returns to infrastructure investment are very different. And maybe I can help fix ideas with, a, with an example from the U.S., which will then maybe generate some interest for uh, the China discussion. Back in the 1800s in the U.S., late 1800s, the U.S. built uh, four railroads across the country. And it would seem like uh, folly. There was no one who lived west of the Mississippi in the United States, and we built four railroads, essentially going through four sets of nowhere over uh, the most ambitious uh, kind of uh, ground that you could ever cover at that time. All those railroads, uh, with the exception of one, went bankrupt. <laughs> so the private returns to uh, building these railroads ended up being uh, very difficult to capture. Um, However, the public returns to those railroads were um, incalculable. I mean, that's what made the United States the United States in many ways in building our country. And I think there's a useful analogy there to think about the positive aspects of China's investment outside, within both and without, especially outside of China's investment uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. China is doing a little bit of a U.S. railroad expansion with one belt, one road. And so my first observation would be the private return to that may be very low. That may be something, uh, if you were sitting around trying to score things as a, as a bureaucrat uh, uh, in, in the Chinese government, you're going to have a very, very low rate of return on that. But the social rates of return on that may be massive. I mean, what it can do to Pakistan, for example, may bring Pakistan into the 21st century in a way that uh, would be impossible. But still, I think you have to have a pretty sober-minded view of the potential returns to this. And I haven't seen that. Uh, I haven't seen, I'm no expert on this, but I haven't seen the kind of cost benefit, coal dyed cost benefit analysis that you'd want to bring to one belt, one road. I've seen a few estimates, and it kind of seems like uh, you're not getting a very high rate of return if you were actually scoring uh, what the user cost of capital is, uh, even though it might be a good thing from a social perspective, much like the US railroads. Another high-level observation I wanted to make is that um, oftentimes the discussion around investment and productivity is, 
is understood uh, with some kind of growth accounting exercise. We have some labor inputs, we have some investment inputs, and then the leftover bit, uh, which was famously called by Solo the measure of our ignorance, is they just call it TFP, which is some unmeasured residual. And obviously you want to make TFP growth as, as high as possible because that's what's generating um, you know, uh, uh, improved uh, quality of life in, uh, in all countries. In my view, and certainly my academic research, tried to emphasize that TFP is really just mismeasured investment. And so I think this really highlights just how important this discussion is because everybody knows that it's good to have more total factor productivity. I think what people do not then get beyond to understand is that total factor productivity typically is mismeasured either human capital investment or oftentimes in developed economies, mismeasured investment. And to help fix ideas, a couple examples, one very infrastructure-y and one, one more recent and uh, tactile for you, which is uh, the U.S. enjoyed amazing productivity growth in the 90s. I think it was essentially mismeasured IT investment. So we uh, were able to do just-in-time inventories. We were able to put a computer on everyone's desk. Uh, really, we were able to do amazing things. And so the reason why we enjoyed such uh, great GDP growth was because of our ability to reorganize the economy through that um, you know, absorption of uh, investment, which is hard to measure by just saying there's one quantity of computer on your, on your desk. You were able to be your own travel agent, be your own secretary, be your own uh, health care provider. You are able to do all kinds of things with just that one input. And so it's important when thinking about investment to just understand that that's the thing that's going to generate TFP. Probably the most compelling example So uh, it, this, is a good, this is a good example of how important investment in technology is so we can communicate. So uh, <laughs> the other compelling example maybe from the U.S. is, of course, the interstate highway system, which China is doing a version of with railroads and one belt, one road and, so, uh, road, and so forth. So after the interstate highway system was built, the U.S. enjoyed an amazing period for that and other reasons, uh, uh, an amazing period of total factor productivity growth because we were able to uh, monetize those investments in, in other uh, different ways. So first point is the public and private returns can be very, very different. And if you're just scoring things for private returns, you probably would never do one belt, one road. So you need some other rationale to be doing these infrastructure projects. And I think the other thing is just to emphasize how important this discussion is. The second main point is to say uh, investment is really Human capital investment is also important, but investment is really the thing we should be focusing on, whether it's in the U.S. because of the new tax bill, whether it's in China inside the country, or whether it's in China through one belt, outside of China through one belt, one road. It exactly focuses the discussion where it needs to be when it comes to um, productivity. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Carla. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, the invitation. Uh, there are three points I would like to touch on. First, I would like to give you a sense of the global size of um, mergers and acquisitions and the share of China's companies. Uh, second, uh, in the last uh, several months, uh, especially uh, 2017, uh, the size of ODI overseas uh, direct investment actually tumbled, tumbled uh, 29.4%. And that's actually official data on that. Uh, and that number was uh, 120 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, compared to 170 billion dollars in 2006. So it tumbled a, a lot. Um, I would like to offer my observations on the reasons why. And the last uh, point I would like to make is that there might be some uh, cooperation area between the U.S. and China. Uh, first, about the size of the global mergers and acquisition, I have a data from uh, IMAA and Bloomberg. Uh, the companies uh, globally in 2017 announced the total value of 3.5 billion U.S. dollars uh, mergers and acquisitions, and among them, 
the share of China's companies uh, was seven to eight percent, and the size was two hundred fifty billion dollars. That's only the announced value, and not might not be uh, fully implemented um, by the announced value. So that's the size uh, of global. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, and also the chatter share. And the second point I would like to touch on about the reasons why uh, the, uh, the ODI in 2017 uh, tumbled 29%. Uh, 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 there might be uh, three uh, reasons from my point of view. The first is uh, the concern about the potential loss and financial risks uh, related to the takeover of trophy assets. Uh, a lesson actually people should learn uh, from uh, 1980s corporate Japan. Uh, you know, in, 2000, uh, in 1989, actually, uh, the bubble of a uh, Japanese equity market, uh, market burst. And a year after, uh, the economy bubble burst. And in 1992, uh, there happened a banking crisis uh, of Japan. Uh, that actually a very uh, tremendous uh, event. And a lot of uh, projects uh, exercised, um, acquisized by Japanese corporates come a lot, especially during uh, the tremendous appreciation of yen against the dollar. So that could be a tremendous loss of financial risks, which uh, China should learn from. That's one of the reasons. The second is some companies, some Chinese companies actually uh, disregarded uh, the environment, energy, and safety regulation in target countries, uh, which resulted in disputes and also impaired uh, China's image. Um, and the third uh, reason from my uh, perspective uh, might be trying to close the loopholes uh, of suspicious capital outflows and possible money laundering. And um, that could be uh, one of the very important reasons on that. That's only my ob observation. The final uh, point I would like to touch on is um, the potential cooperation uh, between China and the US in infrastructure sector. Uh, I remember uh, several weeks ago at Harvard University, Robert Lawrence is here today, there was a seminar uh, by Dennis, uh, by Jason Furman. Jason Furman was here just now, he met live now, uh, about uh, the infrastructure, uh, rethinking infrastructure in the US, and Jason, uh, talking about the gap to finish, uh, finance the infrastructure uh, needs for U.S. Uh, he talked about uh, the tax cut, uh, more than one trillion uh, deficit might be uh, generated from that. But immediately after uh, the tax cut per uh, apply, at the end of uh, 2017, uh, infrastructure spending a proposal uh, came out, which could be uh, amounted to uh, 1.5 trillions. And among those 1.5 trillion uh, dollars, 200 billion from federal government. And the others, there could be three potential resources for that. Uh, one is the local and uh, uh, a state and the local uh, governments. Another one uh, might be uh, municipal bond markets and also uh, PPP, private uh, partner uh, uh, partnership, private public partnership. But the the gap could be obvious. So 
in the past several years, uh, the ODI uh, from China uh, uh, companies, actually, the outstanding volume is now 1.4 trillion US dollars. That's a big size. And since 2013, the annual ODI of China's uh, companies um, has been at a level of 100 billion US dollars. So there might be some uh, cooperation area on that. Um, I'm st still thinking about it. Uh, that's my uh, point. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my topi topic will be a little bit, little bit different. I'd like to talk uh, uh, crypto assets and investment banking. Uh, because we are traditional uh, investment bank in Hong Kong, we hold uh, Hong Kong SFC licenses. But we are also open-minded to to be a crypto assets investment bank. Uh, so, so I think the uh, the government and the regulator should encourage uh, traditional financial institutions uh, jump into the uh, crypto world. Uh, that that in 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 Hong Kong and in mainland China, I think we uh, account for uh, at least 20 percent of uh, the the hash power of, of the uh, uh, the total hash power. Uh, the reasons why I, I think re regulators should encourage. Uh, traditional financial institutions into this world because th that will make uh, a new balance. Uh, in Now in the crypto world, uh, there is uh, uh, early, adop the, the early adopters and those uh, innovators, they are all anti, you know, they, they, they are fans of, of decentralizations. And if the uh, regulators encourage uh, traditional uh, investment bank like us to go into the, this uh, uh, crypto world, it will be make, uh, make uh, mit mit mitigating, uh, mitigating those risk of uh, uh, financial stability and the tax evasion and, and, and others. So um, actually, uh, as we have a uh, draft uh, plan of actions to do uh, this, uh, to, comb to, do, to be a crypto assets uh, investment bank, I think that's a uh, lot of opportunities, and there is. Uh, so that's my opinion. Uh, well, simple. Thank you. Got a question here. Uh, so I, I was just going to make a comment. I was going to make a comment about uh, corruption anyway, and since crypto came up, maybe I'll make uh, two comments about corruption. Um, the. Other observation maybe that's adjacent to the point I was making earlier about the difference between the public and private returns to infrastructure investment is that if you want to find corruption, if you want to find corruption, uh, go to the construction industry in any country. So, uh, you know, the, the U.S. construction industry is maybe relatively less corrupt than uh, emerging market construction industries, but probably it's the most corrupt area of, uh, of uh, the U.S. And similarly, when you go into other countries, if you want to find corruption, Go into uh, go into the construction sector. So, is an, yet another reason to be very um, careful about some of the gauzy-eyed optimism that I'd seen on One Belt and One Road, because a lot of the returns are being appropriated by essentially uh, corrupt actors who are uh, taking the money, which reduces the uh, reduces the returns further still. With regard to crypto investment, I just have an observation. So this is. Um, 
uh, just comment on on uh, on building up, let's say, kind of even state champions or particular companies that are invested in crypto. Crypto, when it comes to the investment side of things, is um, is very wasteful. So cryptocurrencies right now, are, you know, the crypto mining is using about the uh, energy output of. I don't know why they chose Bulgaria. I guess they were just looking down the list of uh, matching up uh, the amount of energy being used. But we're using all of Bulgaria's, the equivalent of all of Bulgaria's electrical grid to be mining for Bitcoin. And so mining for Bitcoin has this kind of, you know, you're actually doing something. Just remind yourself what the building up a crypto sector is doing. When you're doing that mining, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to create a... Um, you're going to uh, make it very costly to unwind any of the transactions in the blockchain. So people will say mathematically it's immutable what's happened in the blockchain. It's immutable because you're doing so much wasteful investment in order to build the blockchain. So think about an investment project instead of saying mining, crypto, uh, that kind of thing. Instead, let me describe the investment project for you as I'm going to buy a server farm and just run it and have no economic value out of it and spend a bunch of money doing that. The opportunity cost of that, of course, is that you could be doing something more useful with those investment dollars. So whenever people talk about mining and crypto, I get quite worried because it's actually something that's subtracting from TFP. This is not a growth enhancing initiative to be wasting all of Bulgaria, the equivalent of Bulgaria's electrical grid on verifying transactions. Imagine if I went to you and said, uh, I have a new plan for a new kind of competitor to MasterCard, which makes it so that in order to verify a transaction, you have to spend uh, half an hour or an hour using a supercomputer in order to essentially verify the transaction. You'd say this is probably not a very good way to exchange goods and services. So I think there's a lot on blockchain that can be useful. I mean, you could get rid of whole industries. Like we shouldn't have a title insurance industry. We shouldn't have medical records uh, on paper. There are all kinds of things that you can imagine being digitized, but I would just urge people not to think like you're going to build a national champion and enhance your GDP growth by investing in the crypto area because the likelihood is it's very, very wasteful. That sets us up for a good discussion. Are there questions? <laughs> yes. Or where are the mics? Oh, yes. Uh, Bob Davis with the Wall Street Journal. I have a question on One Belt, One Road. You mentioned it a little bit. There has been some talk about um, concern about One Belt, One Road in terms of finance and getting out of control. Um, uh, in uh, Poor countries getting too indebted, China not keeping good track of how much it's actually lending. I was wondering if that's a concern. Can I just answer that? So uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, – thank Mr. Davis because he's been doing the absolute, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to meet you from afar because I have been watching every one of your stories with uh, keen interest and I didn't know your work before all of the trade stuff and I think you're absolutely the finest trade reporter out there and beyond that you have a sideline and writing amazing feature stories as well like I commend everyone to read the Elkhart uh, Indiana story where uh, you went through what some amazing changes going on in the U.S. economy. I would just say uh, yes to your question. One Belt, One Road, the essence of it is you're wasting a lot of money on roads to nowhere. And whether that's in Africa that you're going to build a railroad to a, to a uh, mine that maybe is not useful. It, it emphasizes the importance of building institutions around um, the actual investments. And if you don't build the institutions around the actual investments, sometimes you aren't going to be able to monetize them. I'm not saying always, but a lot of the projects that – I've looked at specifically a little bit of preparation for this panel. They just seem like they um, they are future white elephants in the making. Uh, a massive global port in Sri Lanka. I mean, uh, do they need one? Uh, it's not obvious to me. Maybe the Chinese Navy wants to stop there when they have a bigger blue water navy, and so it has some other ancillary geopolitical benefit. But Singapore. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka doesn't have a global port for probably a good reason, that it doesn't need a global port. I mean, you're not building a new Dubai in Sri Lanka, so why are we spending billions of dollars there? And then, of course, the local government was, got indebted, and then they have problems. Uh, it's, it can be tricky, I think. Uh, I would like to add only one point on that, um, which is uh, how to do the benefit-cost analysis. Uh, it's actually uh, very difficult to do that at this stage uh, in terms of those infrastructure projects. 
It is so um, for the uh, Belt and Road initi Initiative projects, but also for other infrastructures in other countries, such as the 1.5 trillion infrastructure in the US. The gap to finance those uh, products could be huge because some of those infrastructure projects could not generate enough profits uh, to satisfy the needs of investors. So that's the reason why. So how to implement this um, benefit cost analysis could be crucial. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone on the panel, for all the great comments. Uh, Rebecca Patterson, Bessemer Trust. I wasn't going to go there, but since you brought up crypto, first of all, Jason, I share your skepticism around Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies. It's my understanding that there are a lot of folks who are trying to develop a new technology to mine these currencies that would be much less energy intensive. So hopefully that happens. That would make it much more feasible. But what I'm intrigued by are the central banks around the world, including the PBOC, that's investigating the possibility of a sovereign cryptocurrency. And it seems to me if one were ever to take off, China would be a great place to have it because so many in the population are already using digital payment systems. So giving up bills and coins would not be as difficult as us Luddites here in the United States. Um, but also if you have a government that's eager to see where money is going and not going, i.e. over the border, a cryptocurrency could be a huge advantage for China. So since you brought up crypto, it's something you're actively looking at. I wondered if you had any views on where the government might be going with some of the projects they're doing in terms of working with local financial institutions to actually test out a possible sovereign crypto. Uh, initially, I think nobody uh, is interested in these topics. It uh, seems like, yes, uh, I think uh the the government uh is not uh, they have different view with uh, the uh, the market of, of crypto uh i'm a, i'm a traditional uh a banker but now i'm a fan of uh, crypto assets mm -hmm. so why is that so to me in in my world uh, so many people around me, they don't care about the topics you talk about today. Because uh, we think uh, blockchain together with uh, crypto will change the world, fundamentally change the world. Because uh, I have never seen uh, uh, technology has uh, greater potential for humanity because uh, it's a uh, it's to have uh, 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 safety and transparency, uh, transparency and and uh, efficiency. So you see, even the regulators, uh, even in China, the government are very. They are pushing people to uh, invest into the blockchain, so the the uh, underlying uh, technologies. They don't like crypto. Uh, assets, but crypto assets to the pub public blockchain, the crypto assets uh, is a gas to 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 inside the ecosystem of the blockchain. So, uh, yes, it's lots it's lots of uh, uh, downsides over there. So that's why I think the government uh, go to uh, wrong directions. They should encourage the uh, more the uh, so we we are uh, investment banking. We are regulated. We get used we get used to be uh, regulated. So, but now in in the crypto world, nobody want to be regulated. Even even not say about regulated. They they don't want to be they want to be decentralized. They don't want central. So, um, so I think things. Uh, what I mean, the new balance is, I think things will be worse and worse because uh, the regulator and the government uh, go uh, the 
this direction. And the uh, people in, in crypto world, they have another direction. And the government want to regulate, want to manage, want to. Uh, so to me and to lots of uh, uh, crypto, I think there will be crypto asset investment bank. And, and uh, to our world, that's our opportunities. Because I believe, I believe that, you know, there, 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 there is a, uh, we, I'm the early adopters and there will be uh, later adopters. And if everybody understand it, there is no so, so many uh, opportunities. So whatever uh, the government thinks, uh, everything is there, the opportunity is there. So that's my point. But uh, talking about the ways, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fundamental technology is uh, changing every day. So we have different uh, consensus uh, mechanism. We don't use a POW now. Like US, we use uh, DPoS. That with no uh, electricity consumption. So that will be the trend. So it is in, uh, in, the, in its uh, infancy uh, stage. But I think with so many uh, smarties, uh, entrepreneurs, and programmers and uh, uh, venture capitalists and it will be the future will come very soon than you expect it to be yeah we've consumed all of our time and i'd like to invite you to uh, join with me in thanking our three very final panelists and it is the final one so thank you very much all three of you